next on Unsolved Mysteries. A three-year-old girl is found wandering alone. Her mother is dead and her father is missing. Is he another victim? Or could he be the killer? Some say there's a Bigfoot-type creature in Florida's Everglades. Photographs, footprints, and hair samples suggest that they may be right. Two men vanish under the same bizarre circumstances. One was writing a novel about the other's disappearance. Coincidence, or is there a secret connection? And a man confesses to kidnapping and murdering his own sister-in-law. These are stories with intriguing secrets and surprising revelations, so stick around. I'm Dennis Farina, and for the next hour, this is Unsolved Mysteries. Washington. On a December morning, Mike Reamer, his girlfriend Diana, and their daughter Crystal set out on a day trip to the local mountains. They drive to a scenic area to look for a Christmas tree. Mike is a trapper, so he also plans to check his animal traps. Are you lost? Later that day, three-year-old Crystal is found alone at a department store near Tacoma. Crystal's parents had vanished without a trace. When asked where they were, Crystal only said, mommy is in the trees. Before long, police would understand exactly what she meant, and it was not a pleasant revelation. Attention shoppers, we have a little lost girl up here to her service desk. She's about three years old. After being checked at a local hospital, Crystal is sent to a temporary foster home. Three days later, she is recognized from a news broadcast and taken in by Diana's mother. And as soon as she saw me, she put her arms out and said, Grandma. And they put her down and she ran to me. And, and I've had her ever since. The same weekend the couple disappeared, Mike's best friend, Steve Two scoured the countryside on the ground and from the air. We searched from the spot where Mike would normally start his trap lines, and we followed the whole trap line. And we searched for probably two, three hours without, without nothing. Two months after the couple disappeared, a man walking his dog in a forest near LB, Washington, discovered the body of Diana Robertson. Crystal was correct when she said that her mother was in the trees. Diana was lying in a forest. Mike Reamer's truck was next to her. Diana had been stabbed 17 times and a tube sock was tied around her neck. There was no sign of Reamer. In the truck's cab was an envelope that read I love you, Diana. I feel that it was Mike's handwriting. I have cards that he had given to her on different holidays and things that he signed exactly the same way. I know that Louise Conrad says that handwriting is Michael Reamer's. However, the FBI laboratory is not able to tell us conclusively that that is so. Why did someone put that there? Was it Michael Reamer? as a final goodbye, Diana, I'm sorry? Or was it someone who put it there to throw off the authorities and make them think that? Police believe that this killing was possibly connected to a double murder that had occurred four months earlier in an area where Reamer was known to set his animal traps. A man named Stephen Harkins was found dead in his sleeping bag, shot in the forehead. His companion, Ruth Cooper, 
was found two months later. She had also been shot to death, and like Diana, a tube sock had been tied around her neck. At a later date, I asked to observe the sock which was used around the neck of Ruth Cooper. And when he dumped it out on a desk in the evidence lab, the hair stood up on the back of my neck and I shivered a little. The tube sock on Diana had been tied with exactly the same type of knot as in the earlier murder. Police considered two theories. One was that an unknown serial killer had murdered both couples and then hidden Reamer's body. The second theory was that Mike Reamer himself was the serial killer. Reamer had a history of domestic violence. According to friends and family, Reamer frequently beat Diana. He beat her up. He took everything out on her. He blamed her for things that he did. If he was seeing somebody else, he would turn it around like Diana was seeing somebody else and justify it, you know, in his own mind. A few weeks before her murder, Diana got a restraining order against Reamer. But as Christmas approached, they got back together. I don't know why Diana let Mike come back in. Maybe because she had Crystal. I don't know, maybe he was a sense of security for her. The only thing I can tell you is that she loved him. Often, the victim allows the assaulting party back in. It's, it's really very common. Police had enough circumstantial evidence to issue a warrant for Reamer's arrest, but there was one problem. We can't prove he's alive and we can't prove he's dead. If we could show that he was dead, then it would be my belief that there's an unidentified third party who's going around killing people out there. However, if we can prove that he's alive, he immediately becomes a suspect and uh, that changes the situation dramatically. Diana had told me that Mike had threatened to kill her and that he could get away with it. And I had told her to be careful and that he couldn't get away with something like that. He was just saying things to scare her. Whether Mike Reamer is alive or buried somewhere in the Washington woods, police need to find him. He is six feet tall and weighs 180 pounds. He has blue eyes and at the time of his disappearance, had thinning brown hair and a beard. Reamer also has a small scar on his upper lip. He is a skilled outdoorsman and may be living off the land. He has also worked as a roofer and is an accomplished guitar player. Update. There are new developments in this case. Here's one of our staff with details. The skull of Mike Reamer was discovered recently by a hiker about one mile from where Diana Robertson's body had been found 25 years earlier. No other traces of Reamer have been found, and his cause of death could not be determined. Next, a man kidnaps and murders his own sister-in-law and then makes a daring escape from prison. Massachusetts. I know who you are! One late spring evening, a 29-year-old man Mama. makes his way to a Catholic church. There's something I need to tell you. Can I come inside? The man's name is help. Timothy Berry, and he's about to make a stunning confession. I'm the one that kidnapped Nancy. Tim admits to kidnapping his sister-in-law. And at that very moment, he becomes a murder suspect. 23-year-old Nancy Brown had vanished 16 months earlier from the house that she shared with her mother and her sister. Tim Berry was married to Nancy's sister, who we'll call Sarah, the oldest of four daughters. When their father died, Tim had become the unofficial head of the family. Tim's upbringing was very similar to my own. His parents brought him up very Christian. He believed in the same things I did, very family-oriented. 
For seven years, they were a happy family. And then came the day that Nancy disappeared. It was her regular day off, and she got an early start doing laundry. The only other person in the house was one of her other sisters, 16-year-old Moira, who was homesick from school. Early that morning, Moira heard Nancy slam the door to the back porch and turn on the radio in the kitchen. And that was the last anyone saw or heard of Nancy Brown. A little while after supper, my mother called wondering if I had seen my sister. And I hadn't, and I hadn't spoken to her. And they told me that um, nobody had seen her all day. Mary, have you uh, seen Nancy today? Tim and Sarah, with Sarah's sister, Allison, okay. rushed over to the house and started calling Nancy's friends. She hasn't seen her today. Oh, my God. In what retrospect, Tim's behavior it? seemed just suspicious. Down. It was just not like her. Tim was there with everybody, very concerned, wondering what happened. But he seemed to be more nervous than what the rest of us were. Look at our address book and see if this The group is split up to search the house. In the basement, they found Nancy's glasses. The fact that Nancy's glasses were found on the floor of the cellar was particularly disturbing because the car was gone. Nancy was blind as a bat. She had to have the glasses at all times, especially for driving. The very next day, when she did not appear or report for work, we conducted an investigation. And on the second day, we located the car in a shopping mall, perhaps a mile from a home. Well, there's no advantage of ignition. Nancy's car was unlocked. The keys were under the seat, and there were no signs of foul play. The car alarm was not set, which is unusual for Nancy. She always set the alarm, and there were a few particles of sand inside the car. But that's all that we had at the time. But perhaps the most significant clue to the police is that it was Tim who suggested that they check that particular mall for Nancy's car. Sarah says that as the investigation continued, Tim began to drink heavily. What she didn't know was that the police had asked him to take a polygraph exam, and he refused. Detectives also found out that when Tim Berry was in the Army, he had been accused of murder. While he was found not guilty, the record noted that it was Tim Berry himself who led authorities to the murder weapon and the body. Police now believe that it was more than a coincidence that Tim knew where to look for Nancy's car, but they did not have enough evidence to press charges. For almost a year and a half, the case remained unsolved. And then Tim walked into the church and confessed. I'm the one that kidnapped Nancy. I knew that Nancy, on the days off, would do laundry at her mom's house. So I, uh, I, I broke into the house about 5 a.m and waited for her down under the stairs. And I uh, came apart. I grabbed her and I blindfolded her so she couldn't see who it was. And then I put her in her car. I know who you are. <laughs> Tim Berry told the priest that he wore a fake mustache so no one in the neighborhood would recognize him. He said he drove Nancy to a beach 20 miles north of Everett. He forced Nancy into a wooded area. He was carrying a hunting knife and a military You're shovel. Crazy. No, I'm not. Then why would you be doing something like this? Tim said that when Nancy stood up to him, he killed her. And no one will ever know. I hit her in the back of the head with a shovel, and then I, I slit her throat. It took a lot of courage to tell me his story, Timmy. But don't you think it'd be wise if you told it one more time to the authorities? When he first confessed to us, you know, I just said to him, Timmy, you know, all these years, it's been over 16 months, the investigations been going on. Why didn't you confess before? Why now? He said, because nobody had ever asked him the question, did you murder her? And if that had, he said he would have confessed. 
Later that night, Tim Barry led police into the woods where he had taken Nancy. It's uh, 30 meters over there. The terrain itself was difficult walking. It was very sandy. It was tough on your feet to walk. And Timmy kept looking up at the stars, and I questioned Timmy what, what, why he was looking at the stars. And he said, that's how I find my way to where we're going. It took more than an hour, but Tim finally found the spot where he had killed Nancy. She's over there. In a shallow grave, police found the body of Nancy Brown. She had died exactly as Tim Barry had okay, said. Tim. When he was asked why did he do it, Tim never would tell us why. He just said, this is the story, this is how, don't ask me why. And we, even though we asked, we never got an answer. We never had a motive. It didn't seem like that was his nature. And I, I think the whole family went into total shock. It was just something that was too horrible to have to accept. Tim Barry was convicted of second degree murder and kidnapping. He received a life sentence plus five to 10 years. After serving only eight years, Tim was considered a model prisoner. He was frequently assigned to work details outside the prison. I'm sick of the color gray. It was election day, and Tim was part of a prison crew repainting government offices in downtown Boston. Yeah. That particular day, the building was very busy. There were voting polls on the first floor of the state office building here. People coming and going all day long. Elevator traffic. Remember where it is, right? Yeah. Okay, hold on. It's our understanding that he requested that he go to the men's room at approximately 9.30 that morning. About 15 minutes later, the officer realized that Tim Barry had not returned to his work area upon a check. And we soon realized that the subject had left, taking an elevator down to the first floor and mingled into the floor traffic of the people voting and the pollsters and blended into the crowd and just took off and fled the area. We initiated a ground search, and that search revealed absolutely nothing, as if Timothy Barry just disappeared into the sun, gone. About a year and a half later, Tim Barry walked out of the woods in Vermont. His two teenage children were visiting Tim's sister for Memorial Day. Dad? What? Hey, that's Dad. I had to work, so I didn't get to go to the family vacation home. Sally. I don't think anybody expected what happened. As a matter of fact, I'm certain of that. Dad, Dad come back. Tim stayed for only 10 minutes. It was the last time anyone in the family saw or heard from Timothy Berry. I can't say that I'm frightened, but I have to admit to once in a while looking over my shoulder, wondering if maybe he is in some place watching. I know he would never do anything to hurt the children or put the children in a position where they could be hurt in any way, but I have to admit to wondering update timothy barry is once again behind bars as a direct result of our broadcast barry was arrested in akron ohio he was working as a truck driver using the alias john prendeville barry waived extradition and was returned to massachusetts to serve out the remainder of his sentence next Many people believe that a strange creature is living in the Florida Everglades, and they have the evidence to prove it. The Florida Everglades. This hot, humid swampland is home to some unusual creatures, and unusual people, too. For eight months, David Sheary sat all alone in the middle of the swamp looking for a legendary creature, Florida's own version of Bigfoot called the Skunk Ape. David's interest in the creature began when he was just 10 years old. He and his older brother were exploring the swamps near Ochopee, 75 miles west of Miami. 
my brother noticed something in the distance. What is that? And he said to me, he said, what's that? What, what is that over there? Let me see. Let me see. All right, all right. And I couldn't see it because the grass was too high. So he had to pick me up where I could get a better look. And when I looked out across the prairie, I could see a huge figure, probably eight feet tall, maybe 300 pounds. It was walking on two legs like a man would walk. Oh, man, it was a giant skunk ape. Big. I knew it had to be the skunk ape. A creature that walks like a gorilla and smells like a skunk seems, well, a little unbelievable at best. But David Sheely and his brother aren't the only ones who claim that they've seen it. Folks, you sure picked a beautiful day for your trip through the Everglades. John Vickers is an Everglades tour guide who is familiar with the animals in the area. We're driving a bus down to Turner River Road and I'm pointing out wildlife. There, if you look over to your right, you'll see a couple of the alligators taking their afternoon nap. And all of a sudden, about 200 yards in front of our bus, a creature, hairy, standing upright on its hind legs, crossed the road. One of the passengers tapped me on the shoulder. What was that? Well, I'm not sure. But it's nothing to worry about. I think it's probably the old man that lives out in the Everglades here. I don't think he bought that. Five of the people on the bus claim that they saw what John saw. I don't know whether it was a the real skunk ape or whether it was a hoax, but it's something real. Two days later, real estate agent Jan Brock was on her way to work. I was driving probably about 7.30, 7.45 in the morning, and I noticed something getting ready to cross the road. My first thought was that it had to be a bear. And this particular time I looked and I was like, something was not right. The animal just kind of scurried off across the road and that's when I realized it couldn't have been a bear. I wasn't sure what I saw and uh, didn't really want people to think I was a little nuts, so I didn't say anything about it. Fire Chief Vince Dorr left for work just a little later than Jan. I seen something go across the road. It wasn't dressed in regular shirt and pants like a man. It was more brown or, you know, looked more like a bear color. But I knew it wasn't a bear because it was walking upright. So I speeded up, got up to that area. I got out. I yelled out. Hey! And it stopped and turned. And at that time, I snapped one photograph. This is the actual picture that Vince took of the creature. I saw the picture that Vince had taken, and it was the same thing I saw. Jan seen it, so that made me feel like I wasn't seeing things. When you hear people talking about what they saw, and then you actually see it yourself, obviously you're going to believe that there's something out there. A year after those sightings, David Sheely was on his viewing station, just like he had been for the previous eight months. I was sitting in my tree stand, and I dozed off, and I heard something splashing in the water and it sounded like a person walking towards me. When I looked up, there it was coming right at me at about 100 yards away. I took 27 photographs over a period of about three or four minutes as it crossed the marsh. I couldn't believe what I saw. I, it was uh, almost ghostly, and it wasn't until the next day when I took the camera to the developer that I realized that I had actually captured a skunk ape on film. David asked Dade County archaeologist Bob Carr to study his pictures. These photographs were very compelling. The statue, the size, the motion of this creature did not appear to be a human being. And the suggestion of the gait is very primate-like. I think there are enough details to make one realize that this would have to be a very, very clever hoax to be perpetrated. David also sought the help of Everglades tracker T.L. Riggs. On two occasions, I found footprints in the soft earth. All the tracks that I saw at that particular time, only the ball of the foot and the toes showed. There were none that showed that a heel had been left down. Riggs made plaster castings of the footprints. 
Looking at just the front end of the foot, which is all we can do, I would say that it would have to weigh at least 300 pounds. Riggs came up with an idea for gathering more evidence. He snapped a number of branches at a height of four to five feet, too high a reach for most animals. If a skunk ape came in contact with the jagged twigs, Riggs might just collect a hair sample. By setting a great number of those along trails, I've been able to harvest several legitimate looking hairs that are unlike anything I've ever seen. Was the hair from some unknown creature or was it from a man in an ape suit? In my mind, the evidence we've looked at from Ochapi indicates there's definitely a phenomena that's real. What we don't know is what that phenomena is. We are closer to the answer probably than we've ever been, but the answer will only come when the hair is analyzed and DNA is extracted, and then we will know the molecular and genetic footprint and who and what this creature might be. We sent two hair samples to a lab at Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas. DNA testing was inconclusive. However, analysis with an electron microscope confirmed that the hairs were not synthetic fibers like those used on an ape costume. They were also not the hairs from a bear, gorilla, chimpanzee, skunk, dog, cat, or a human. Update. Several years later, these photographs arrived at the Sarasota, Florida Sheriff's Department. They came with a letter from a woman who did not want to be identified. She claimed that the creature took apples from her back porch on three different occasions. She noticed a foul smell and thought that it might be an orangutan that had escaped from captivity. Are these photographs of an orangutan? Or are they the best evidence yet that the skunk ape is real? We'll leave that answer up to you. Next, the bizarre case of a missing writer whose novel seemed to predict his own disappearance. The tiny village of Silver Plume, Colorado, population 200, lies in the heart of the Rocky Mountains. On an early autumn day, Tom Young closes up his bookshop on Main Street and along with his dog, Gus, disappears. Nine months later, a new resident of Silver Plume, Keith Reinhardt, opens an antique shop at exactly the same location. One summer afternoon, Keith closes up his shop for the day and he disappears. Keith Reinhardt and Tom Young had both run at the same store. They both left town promising to return, and even more curious, Keith was writing a book about Tom's disappearance when he too suddenly vanished. Was it just a coincidence? Keith Reinhardt moved to Silver Plume from Chicago with three goals, to get in shape by mountain climbing, to overcome his fear of heights, and to begin writing a novel. Keith opened an antique shop for summer tours. If it was successful, he and his wife would move to Silver Plume permanently. Keith Reinhardt and I grew up across the street from each other. And we'd known each other about 40 years. And uh, I would say that our relationship was similar to that of, of brothers. Keith was uh, apprehensive and excited. He was here to finish out the last of his 40s in the way that he dreamed of. He felt that very soon he would be starting to get old. He felt he was still young, but he didn't have much time for being young left. Yeah, you got enough stuff, man. Oh, he didn't want to be sitting in a rocking chair 10 years, 20 years from now saying, I should have done this, I should have done that. Nine months earlier, Keith's antique shop had been a bookstore. Tom Young, the man who mysteriously disappeared with his dog, had run the store for about a year. Tom had told people that he was taking a vacation to Europe. 
Three weeks went by before anyone became suspicious about his absence. I think somebody kidnapped Keith Reinhardt became obsessed with Tom Young's disappearance. Dumped him down one of these mine shafts up here. You think so? Yeah. He began talking to everyone in Silver Plume who had known Tom. Do it every day. Yeah, but he's a nice guy. I mean, he don't sure any nice. Keith decided to base his novel on Tom Young. When he began to write, he created a character named Guy Gibson, a composite of himself and Tom. Sometimes it seemed hard for Keith to tell the difference. My father, he was very, very into it. He was talking about the disappearance of Tom Young all the time. Writers like to live the story they're writing about, um, get a feel of it so it's easier for them to write about it. Maybe my father, it's always possible, wanted to feel what it's like to disappear so he could write about it. Hey, Vic, come on down here. I found something. Ten months after Tom Young disappeared, two hunters found the remains of Tom and his dog in the mountains near Silver Plume. Oh, Each had died from a bullet wound to the head. And they found his remains. Also found at the scene was a revolver. And we found out that Tom had purchased a gun uh, approximately four days before he was last known to be in Silver Plume. The Tom Young case is closed, and it has been ruled a suicide, both by the coroner's office and by the Clerkery County Sheriff's Department. One week after Tom's body was found, Keith walked through Silver Plume, telling everyone that he saw that he was going to climb to the top of nearby Pendleton Mountain. Most did not take him seriously because they knew that he had a fear of heights and did not like climbing alone. At 4 p.m., Keith stopped by Ted Parker's cafe. The day Keith disappeared, he was in the cafe and told me that he was going to make it to the top of the mountain. Now I'm going to go all the way to the top. I'm going to do it. If I don't come back, call on the rescue. And he said that in, uh, in jest, I felt. I have this picture of him pointing to the mountain and saying goodbye. That was the last time I saw him. Keith was last seen walking toward Pendleton Mountain at 4.30 in the afternoon, far too late in the day to begin a difficult six-hour hike. That night, Keith Reinhardt did not return. The next day, helicopters were called to search the mountain. On the ground, more than 125 men and a dozen trained dogs combed the difficult terrain for seven days. The Reinhardt search was like looking for the proverbial needle in a haystack. This haystack is 3,000 vertical feet of 60-degree slope. This was about as difficult a search terrain as we cover. We were at a real disadvantage because Keith went into the mountains wearing no more than blue jeans and a flannel shirt and tennis shoes. He had no backpack. He had no equipment. A typical subject of a search will leave lots of clues for us to trace. Um, Keith didn't leave many clues. He didn't have many with him to leave behind. In 30 years of operation, the Colorado Alpine rescue teams had found every single person they searched for. However, they discovered no trace of Keith Reinhardt. Keith's friends found a newspaper next to his computer. The headline was, Tom Young's body found. Still in the computer were these words, part of Keith's unfinished novel. Guy Gypsum changed into some hiking boots and donned a heavy flannel shirt. He understood Tom now and his motivation. Guy closed the door, then walked off towards the lush, shadowless Colorado forest above. Could these words imply Keith Ranhart concluded that Tom Young had killed himself? And then Keith Reinhardt decided to do the same? I don't think Keith would have considered suicide as a solution to anything. Um, he was a very optimistic, upbeat person. His advice to me was always positive mental attitude. So I do not think he would have committed suicide. Some have concluded that Keith Reinhardt and Tom Young were murdered. 
Tom's gun, which was found next to his body, was too corroded for police to compare ballistics. So no match could be found between the gun and the bullet that killed him. This led to suspicion that the bullet came from a different weapon. In addition, those who suspect that Tom and Keith were killed note that both men rented the same space to run their shops. Perhaps they both came across information someone did not want them to know. I think there's foul play involved. I do, I definitely think something, something's going on. He stumbled upon something. A final theory is that Keith planned his own disappearance. At that time of the day, he would have gone for a walk up the mountain and then turn around and come back down the mountain. What I find to be odd is that he did not take either one of his cameras with him, and he was in the habit of usually carrying a camera. He was possibly at a midlife crisis. He was, at that particular moment in time, somewhat frustrated that he couldn't make it off his antique shop in uh, Silver Plume. And he told so darn many people that he was going for a hike. And why somebody would go around town trying to make this point with so many people that he was going for a hike to the south of town, to the north of town, wherever I'm going for a hike up the mountain. Why he made that point, I'm not, I'm not sure. That doesn't set right. This is one week after Tom Young's remains were found. He knows now, as everybody in Silver Plume knew, that Tom Young laid out a bit of a false trail. And I just have to wonder in the back of my mind if Keith did the same. I don't think that Keith would be the type of person to walk away from his whole entire life and leave it behind him. He loved the people in his life. He loved keeping in touch with them. And I don't think he could have left them all behind him. Keith Reinhardt is six feet, two inches tall, weighs 210 pounds and has blue eyes. If you have any information about his disappearance, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a man searches for the American GI who helped save his family during the final days of World War II. For decades, Siegfried and Marguerite Leier of Morlenbach, Germany, have been searching for an American soldier. When Siegfried was just a boy, he formed a friendship with a young GI. March 1945, the final days of World War II. For Germany's civilians, it was a time of uncertainty and despair. One of the innocent victims was young Siegfried Leier, whose neighborhood was destroyed by Allied bombers. Siegfried's mother fled with her three youngest children. They walked 125 miles to be with relatives in the village of Mornenbach. It was very bad. I was four when the war ended. There was very little food to be had. When American troops rolled into Morlenbach, the German citizens were afraid that the conquering army was out for revenge. But instead, they found friendly soldiers who provided them with food and medical supplies. One of those GIs was a young man named Alexander. Hey, you want something? Chocolate. He was sympathetic to me and friendly. Well, you take this home. If it hadn't been for him, perhaps I would not be alive today. He was a guardian angel for me. Hi, I'm, um, I'm Alexander. Siegfried's guardian angel made the effort to track him down at home. Soup? Is this soup? Soup, yeah. Oh, soup, yeah. Alexander took a genuine interest in the family, and soon food shortages were a thing of the past. I wasn't quite sure where Siegfried lived, but I am. They had uns. He brought us food from the army. The same food eaten by them, we also ate. Oh. 
Es riecht gut. Ja, ist jeden Tag. He used to come by every day if only to pick me up and take me to kindergarten or to pick me up there later. Each time he would bring a little food. Here you go. Bread. Over the next three months, Alexander practically became a member of the Lyre family. What he would say to me, I don't know. I don't believe that he knew German, and I certainly didn't know any English. You don't necessarily need words for communication. You can do things with signs, and it went all right. You want to drive? Alexander would often invite Siegfried to tag along on routine patrols around town. Jeep! Jeep! Here, grab the wheel. There you go. Watch the road, watch the road. When I was allowed to drive with him, that was the most wonderful thing. Ah, Ziggy, you're driving! <laughs> when I was sitting in the car and the other children saw me, they were perhaps a bit jealous because I was allowed to drive and they couldn't. I was very proud. I don't know if you're going to understand what I'm trying to say to you. But I have to go. Before long, the time to say goodbye. We may not see each other for a long time. I was sad. Perhaps I would never see him again. As I think about it today, I was really sad. I have always thought about how he helped us and that I should in turn help other people. He was not obliged to us in any way, but he did it as a human being, out of human love. Today, Siegfried has only one memento of Alexander. This photograph taken in the spring of 1945. At the time, Alexander was about 20 years old. Siegfried has never learned Alexander's last name. However, Siegfried does recall that Alexander's unit marched into Morlenbach, Germany on March 27, 1945. If you can help us find this generous, warm-hearted soldier named Alexander, please visit our website at unsolved.com.